Well, let's begin chapter five, which kind of is an exciting chapter. We've, we've sort of left behind all of the foundation work we need to do. And let me again stress that chapter four, yes, was long and it was detailed and it was probably more than you wanted to know. But listen, you're not going to get away from interest rates in this course at all. You're not going to get away from it. It's not going away and it's not going to get easier. You're going to revisit each and every one of those topics. So that being said, don't speed through chapter four thinking, oh, this is nothing. Let's get on to the, the really exciting stuff here. Chapter four is necessary to understand everything else. And you're going to see as we go through the pricing of forwards and futures that you do need something we learned from chapter four. So let's get some terminology out of the way first so that we are all speaking the same language as we go forward. Investment versus consumption asset. This is the first thing that, uh, that we should talk about here. An investment asset is something uh, uh, like stocks, bonds, precious metals. It's something you own for its sake. You hold on to it for its value, for its stream of income, for its potential capital gains. Whatever the case, it's something you invest in and hold on to. Versus a consumption asset. And a consumption asset is something you buy for use. You, you don't hold on to it for any income or future value. You, you actually buy it to consume it. Copper, wheat, oil, corn. Now, the reason we make a distinction between an investment asset and a consumption asset is because they require different pricing arguments. To arrive at a forward or futures price, uh, um, what you'll see is that we're going to use arbitrage arguments to show that if the price were higher than it should be, forces come into the market to lower it. If the price is lower than it should be, forces come into the market to raise it. On investment assets, we can make very sound arbitrage arguments to prove a conclusion about how the forward price is determined. However, with a consumption asset, that argument is weak and flimsy at a certain point where we look at the uh, at the argument and the logic and we think well that's not that's not really solid enough and since we're trying to prove an outcome the proof must be solid not eh, I guess maybe but I don't see it you know it must be solid so this is why we separate investment and consumption assets Pricing of investment assets, straightforward. Pricing of consumption assets, half of it straightforward. The other half requires us to make a small adjustment uh, uh, to, uh, to the downside, which you'll see when we get to. Now, short selling. And if you haven't uh, come across short selling, I don't know why you're taking this course. Uh, the derivatives, uh, uh, if you look at any contract in a derivative, uh, there is a long position and a short position by definition simple as that so you have to understand what short selling is but more important than that I, I'm going to assume you all know what short selling is it being able to short the ability to short is part of the proof of the arbitrage proof we use to arrive at the formula for forward and futures so we have to bring the ability to short <clears throat> into the argument and we're gonna see that eh, that may not always be the case Notice here on the contract, you have a long and short by definition. But an arbitrage argument requires activity at the contract level and activity at the underlying asset level to take advantage of mispricing. Well, at the underlying asset, you may have to go long. That's not a problem. It's never a problem to buy the underlying. But you may also have to go short. Well, not always. You may not always be able to short the underlying, uh, the underlying asset. If you are an owner of the asset, you may be able to sell it in the face of an arbitrage opportunity. And we're going to accept that, well, the sellers are the same as those shorting. If, if somebody, if there's enough people who own it, who will then sell it to take advantage of an arbitrage opportunity, that's all right. And we'll see that that holds up very well with investment assets. But this right here, uh, this point right here, the shorting is where it breaks down under the consumption asset. So we're going to see what modification we need to make there, just giving you a look ahead. Um, on short selling, one of the things that we have to be aware of, especially with investment assets, stocks, bonds, uh, etc. well, these things pay dividends sometimes. 
Well, when we short something, any income earned must be paid by the short position. So that increases our cost of shorting an asset. So if we short a stock and it pays a dividend, it actually increases our costs of shorting. So we have to incorporate those increases in costs into the proper price of the forward or futures price. So remember that. We're going to have to deal with that. We're going to start with a simple case of, hey, no income. Let's make it nice and simple. Then we're going to introduce income, and we're going to see what we have to do. Finally, before we move on, arbitrage opportunities. And, and we're going to arrive at the price of everything with an arbitrage argument. That's all we're going to do is use arbitrage arguments. And they should be neat and tight on both the upside and the downside to show that a futures price should equal some mathematical function of the spot price, the time to maturity, and the interest rate, along with other things that we'll talk about. But arbitrage opportunities requires the ability to short. And that's why we introduce shorting. To make our arguments, we must have the ability to short. Or, in the absence of shorting, the ability or and or the willingness to sell. Now, those who own a consumption asset always have the ability to sell. It's the willingness that matters. I may have the ability to sell something to take advantage of a profit, but I may say, you know what? It's a lot of work and a lot of risk to take advantage of that riskless profit. I have more value in holding on to the, the commodity right now than I do selling it. And we're going to introduce something called a convenience yield that takes care of this willingness to sell. I might not be willing to sell even though I have the ability to sell and our arbitrage arguments uh, require uh, certain assumptions which we'll see next and one of the assumptions is a willingness and an ability. You can't just have the ability and no willingness. They have to, you have to have both. So let's have a look at those assumptions and then let's just jump right into the pool. Right then, let's have a look at uh, some of the assumptions that we're going to make that uh, that we're going to put in force for the entire chapter. Now, there is a tendency to read over this quickly and then forget it, so that when you get to a later argument uh, and you're reading it and you're saying, "But it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me." I remind you at that point, or I remind students at that point, go back and read those assumptions that the argument is based upon, then reread what you're doing, and you'll see that, oh, okay, I get it, because you're assuming this and that, oh, okay, that, that makes more sense. So, don't run over the assumptions, and here they are. Now, I'll have a word to say about them after, but let's just go through them first. Assumption number one, no transaction costs, which means you can enter and exit trades without a transaction cost. Number two, the same tax rate on all trading profits, and we'll see that this is, this, is fairly, this is fairly acceptable. Number three, that the participant can borrow and lend at the same risk-free rate. Now, there are two assumptions bundled into this one. Number one is that they can obtain the risk-free rate because that's the rate we're going to use to price out these contracts is the risk-free rate. Number one is that they can obtain the risk-free rate. The second assumption is that they can both borrow and lend at the same rate. Typically, you'll lend at one rate. If you go to a bank and, and, and invest your money or in a savings account, you'll get one rate, but if you want to borrow, you get a much higher rate, and that spread is the bank's profit. Well, here, we're not assuming any spread that if somebody wants to borrow, they can do it at the same rate that somebody would like to lend at. This is typically uh, uh, reserved for only the big players. Your typical investment banks uh, are your big players. So uh, this is not for everyone. So these assumptions for the small retail trader are absolutely unrealistic. Yes, the average person on the street is not going to do this. But that's not necessary to prove the pricing models that we're going to prove. We just need a certain group of people in the marketplace where these assumptions actually do come very close to reality. And this one, yeah, that's fairly straightforward. And finally, arbitrage opportunities are taken. If they're there, they're taken. It would be like me saying, if you're walking down the street and you see $20 on the sidewalk, you're going to pick it up. It's not a question of, well, I got to bend over. I'm a little bit late right now. I don't really know if I want another 20 You're going to take it. Money on the street will be picked up. This is money on the street. So, this implies two things as well. 
it implies number one the ability the ability to take uh, to take uh, uh, advantage of arbitrage opportunities which also means that you're one of these big guys but it also uh, implies the willingness to take advantage of it again the twenty dollars on the street if you're unwilling to pick it up so if there's a twenty dollar bill on the street you have the ability to pick it up and you probably have the willingness to pick it up but if there's a nickel on the street you have the ability to pick it up but maybe you're just not willing to do it it's a crowded street you don't want to be seen bending over to pick up a nickel do you get that so even though the nickel exists on the street and it's free money for anyone who bends over and picks it up and everybody has the ability to bend over and pick it up the willingness may not be there now for somebody who makes a hundred thousand dollars a year they're not gonna bend over and pick up a nickel for somebody without a job walking down the street they're gonna pick up a nickel but to make the argument that the nickel should not exist on the street because it's free money would require that everybody has the willingness and the ability to pick it up I'm making a, a very important point when we get to the consumption commodity here is that there is a difference between ability and willingness willingness has a cost the cost for me to bend over and pick up a nickel in public is my pride maybe my pride isn't worth a nickel people would look at me and say guys picking up a nickel off the street but if I bend over and pick up a twenty dollar bill most people look ah oh, that guy got twenty bucks lucky son lucky well, I, I caught myself there lucky son of anarchy lucky whatever but I'm a lucky whatever uh, there's no cost to me for me to pick it up I'm perfectly willing as anybody else would be willing in fact I may have to fight some people off I am willing to do that too so that's important arbitrage opportunities are taken willingly by those who have the ability all right so now let me talk about uh, the sum of all these things here uh, no transaction costs that is a problem that is a problem because you're not going to get away from that there are transaction costs but as a percentage of the transaction itself for the very large players these transaction costs are almost minimal they, they can almost be ignored uh, same tax rate on all trading profits well listen if you're in the business of, of making trading profits it's all considered regular income so that's a that's basically as close to reality as you can get borrow and lend at the risk-free rate yes arbitrage opportunities are taken all will have the ability it is the willingness that is a bit of a problem now if we see in reality that a futures price doesn't hold to the models that we prove we can't say well it's because the assumptions are garbage no if it doesn't hold it is because of one of these assumptions not holding that's the nice thing about having these assumptions is once we have a model we can compare it with reality if reality is different than the model it must be because of one of these four reasons so at least now we know we can see a mispricing we could say well probably the transaction costs are too expensive to completely close the arbitrage opportunity or perhaps there's a lack of willingness to completely close the arbitrage opportunity but we can at least look to see which of the four things is causing it that's the nice thing about the assumption great notation we need notation now capital T will be the time to delivery in years from the time that we enter into a forward or futures contract to the time it expires to the time of the delivery date s not is the spot price of the underlying today we have a contract remember uh, you'll have the contract this is the level of the uh, forward or futures and every contract has an underlying asset well the s not applies to the price of the underlying asset f not the forward or future price today is the price implied in the contract and that is the one we'll derive we got to figure out well what is the price what is the forward price or the futures price we will know t we will know s not and we will know r r is our z rate uh, or the zero rate per annum with continuous compounding for the period of time specified by t so uh, um, if it's a, 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 um, a three-month contract we're going to use the the one-year rate uh, multiplied by the period of time so uh, we can see that we're going to use R and T in combination right so the Z rate per annum with continuous compounding notice it is per annum we're not looking for a three month Z rate or a six month Z rate we're looking for the Z rate per annum with continuous compounding typically LIBOR so there you go there's your assumptions don't forget your assumptions 
because to understand some of the arguments we make later on, you have to understand that, wait a minute, these are the assumptions we made. So while the argument may think, but I can't do this and you can't, no, that's the point. You can't do it because you cannot borrow and lend at the same risk-free rate. So that's why we want to keep these in mind and I'll refer back to them time and time again so that you don't lose uh, a focus on the fact that we're building a an argument for a pricing model we're not trying to describe what really happens for everybody out there just what enough people can and are able to do such that the price does hold we're just setting an arbitrage argument to prove a pricing model remember what I just said there that's all we're doing okay let's move on